Also, Panchana is the founder and chair of adversary board of BIAMC at Atmajaya University. Professor Supanjana is also listed as a legal representative and expert witness in several international arbitrations and also listed as a mediator or conciliator in national and international dispute settlement. Professor Supanjana is also a member of Working Group 3 related to evaluation and impact analysis of Indonesian Economic Package National Tax Force on speeding up and effectiveness in the implementation of Economic Policy Package in Coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs. Also a member of Special Legal Expert Team for the Ministry of Defense. Professor Supanjana in the past was also a consultant for improving Indonesia business climate through streamlining the Ministry of Trade's laws and regulations related to export import procedure in 2016 until 2017. Professor Supanjana was also a senior regulatory training specialist, delivery of toolkit for the designing and implementation of economic policy reforms in coordinating Ministry for Economic Affairs, Jakarta and Bandung 2017. Professor Supanchana, for the session, the time is yours. Perhaps you can unmute it first, Prof. Okay, now? thank you. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, thank you for the introduction to the moderator. And good morning to my dear members of the international law community, uh, UNS. I have some good friends, good colleagues from the UNS, yeah, Pak Dr. Hari Purwadi, Bu Emi Latifa, yeah. Yes. They are also my good friends. Um, first of all, on behalf of the Bali International Arbitration and Mediation Center, I would like to express uh, uh, my gratitude. And it is also an honor for BMC to be invited at this uh, legal visit 2020, yeah, organized by the international law community of UNS. Um, for your information, the issue of uh, arbitration in pandemic situation has already been anticipated actually by the Bali International Arbitration and Mediation Center. For your information, uh, last year's BMC Summit in Bali, we have already discussed on the online dispute resolution, including online arbitration, due to the emergence of new technology. Yeah, even a very hot discussion was uh, uh, at that time uh, sparked the issues on whether a human being can be replaced by the AI based uh, robot yeah, acting as arbitrator. It's a very interesting topic, also. Uh, today, I am assigned by the committee to talk about the step by step of international commercial arbitration, uh, its proceedings, uh, award and enforcement. For your information, in the last two years, I'm handling an international case at the ICC, at the International Chamber of Commerce, as the chief counsel on behalf of the Ministry of Defense. Uh, there, there is a case between a company uh, in Hungary and Liechtenstein against the Minister of Defense regarding the Indonesian Satellite Communication Project. Let me uh, start with the systematic, please. Next slide, please. Yes, I'll use the uh, simple systematic. I will start with the international arbitration agreements because there is no arbitration without agreements. So agreement is very important in the arbitration case. And secondly, uh, related to the appointment of arbitrators in international arbitration, because arbitrations 
arbitrators is very important in the process of uh, settling the international disputes through arbitration. Uh, and then I will uh, follow up with the proceedings award and enforcement in international arbitration and some list of relevant international instruments for your uh, reference. Yeah. Next, please. Yeah, this is the uh, about the international arbitration uh, agreement. Yeah, as you may uh, aware that uh, arbitration agreement can be in the form of the uh, what we call it the, the agreement pre or before the dispute arise, and also in the form of an agreement after the dispute uh, arise. Yeah. Next, please. Yeah, basically, as I have already uh, mentioned, that there is no arbitration without agreement. Although we know that under, for example, Unidroa principles of international commercial contract uh, 2016, and based on, for example, uh, United, United Nations Convention on Contract of International Sales Scope Goods, that an agreement can also be in the form of oral agreement or can also be in the form of or incorporated by conduct or common usage or by conduct based estoppel or incorporated by uh, reference. But as far as the arbitration is concerned, when you would like to submit a case before the International Court of Arbitration, for example, you have to show a written agreement. So there must be a proof that there is an agreement that referred to the settlement of disputes through arbitration. Next, please. Yeah, this is uh, the types of instruments uh, that contain arbitration clauses. Yeah, can be in the form of contract, trust, corporate articles of agreement, or even in the form of the testamentary wills. Next. Sometimes we are also facing some, what we call it as a problematic arbitration agreement. It can be in the form of null and void arbitration agreement. We cannot make, for example, an arbitration clause at the settlement of dispute clause which refer to, for example, an agreement which is forbidden by law for arbitration on gambling issues, for example. It is, it is a null and void arbitration agreement. And also, we also find some inoperable and ineffective arbitration agreements. For example, in the agreement, it only referred to arbitration, but without further elaboration whether the arbitration a forum is uh, chosen by the parties, for example, whether it's subject to certain rules of arbitration, the language of arbitration, governing law and everything. So we have to be careful when we try to write an arbitration agreement to make it effective and operable instead of inoperable and effective, ineffective arbitration agreements. Now I would like to talk about the appointment of arbitrators in international arbitration. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, we will talk about the party's autonomy to select arbitrators because basically it is uh, uh, upon the approval of party uh, to uh, select the arbitrators within yeah within the rules and procedures of arbitration whether it is an institutional arbitration rules or whether it is based on rules of arbitration as agreed by the parties uh, talking also about the exercise of party autonomy to select arbitrators restriction concerning arbitration etc next please i would like to elaborate in uh, one by one yeah Regarding the party's autonomy to select arbitrators, uh, it is reflected in some international instruments, such as under New York Convention, under the National Arbitration Legislation, for example, 
and also under some institutional arbitration rules like ICC rules or UNCITRA rules or other rules. Yeah, uh, and then uh, uh, there is some consequences of failure to comply with contractual appointment mechanism for arbitrators because they will face some difficulties in selecting uh, arbitrators at the later. Uh, next, we are talking about the exercise of parties' autonomy to select arbitrators. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yes, yeah. This is an uh, uh, exercise of parties' autonomy to select arbitrators. It is, to up, it is up to the consent of the disputing parties, actually, uh, to select whether they would like to select one arbitrator or three arbitrators or even more. Yeah? And also, it is up to the consent of the disputing parties also to, to uh, def define the method of selection of arbitrators, whether it is based on institutional rules or it is based on their concern, for example. Next, next slide, please. We are talking about the number of arbitrators, as I have uh, uh, talked previously, that it can be based on uh, sole arbitrator. It depends, actually, on the complexity of the case. If the case is very simple, then maybe the parties can agree on selecting only one sole arbitrator but if the case is for example more complicated then maybe the parties should have the preference to select uh, what we call it an arbitration tribunals which consists of uh, three arbitrators and can can be more yeah uh, next please uh, the next, yeah, we are talking about the method of selection of arbitrators. Uh, basically, uh, when there is a case of arbitration and one party submit, for example, a request for arbitration, and uh, in such a document of a request for arbitration, they also uh, appoint or nominate a co-arbitrators. Yeah. Uh, while, uh, for example, in the answer to the request for arbitration, it is based on, for example, ICC rules, the, the other party, yeah, the respondent, may also select uh, co-arbitrators. And, 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 of course, uh, uh, they could also then appoint uh, another arbitrator to be the president of the arbitral tribunal. And there are some procedures, yeah. In general, there are some procedures by interviewing, interviewing the prospective arbitrators and also asking for their availability, etc. Uh, sometimes in selection, in selection of arbitrators, in, in our case, yeah, in, in the case that we handle. On, on behalf of the Ministry of Defense at the International Chamber of Commerce, for example, at one time we challenged we challenge the nomination of arbitrator as proposed by the claimant. Why? Because at that time we tried to profile the nominated arbitrator and we found out that she has a certain relations with the councils of the claimant were something. So this is something uh, against the basic principles of arbitration that an arbitrator should be freed from any conflict of interest. Yeah. So sometimes, uh, sometimes a party may challenge the nomination of arbitrator based on the basic principles of arbitration. Next, we are talking about the restriction concerning, uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, we are talking about the restriction concerning arbitrators, impartiality, nationality, qualification, and experience under national law. Basically, basically, one of the basic principles of an arbitrator is that, of course, he knows the way to manage the arbitration process, especially those 
to be appointed as the president of the uh, arbitration tribunal. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the arbitrator can be those who have background, legal background, or without any legal background. But in certain uh, jurisdiction, for example, there are some restriction. Yeah? For example, there is a requirement for arbitrators, independence and impartiality, but this is a must. Sometimes there is some requirements on nationality uh, of sole and residing arbitrators. And then also some legal qualification and civil rights. Yeah. There are some requirements to be appointed as an uh, arbitrator. Next, we are talking about the uh, requirements. Uh, next slide, yes. Next slide, please. Yeah, we are talking about the requirements of arbitrators, independence, and impartiality. As I have mentioned previously, it is the very basic principles in the arbitration proceedings that an arbitrator should be independent and impartial to the parties or to disputing parties. These requirements are reflected under, for example, national arbitration legislation. You can find it in many national legislation concerning arbitration, that this requirement uh, is very important. But you, can, but you could also find under some institutional arbitration rules, like UNCITRA rules, for example, or EXIT rules, or ICC rules, or any other institutional arbitrations, like uh, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center rules, or SIAC rules, etc. And it is also uh, uh, can be found out uh, from the uh, uh, IBA guidelines, International Bar Association guidelines on conflict of interest, on the provisions of disclosure obligation of arbitrators, and, uh, and, and, and there are some, of course, some ground for finding lack of impartiality. Yeah, as I mentioned that uh, based on our uh, profiling to one of the arbitrator as dominated by one party, uh, we found out that there is a potential uh, violation uh, regarding the independency, the impartiality, the neutrality of an arbitrator. That's why this requirement of arbitrators' independence and impartiality is, is very important. Yeah. Next uh, slide. This is about contractual limitation on arbitrator's qualification. Sometimes there are some contractual nationality requirement, contractual language requirements, expertise and accreditation requirements, legal qualification, and some prohibition against legal qualification. And uh, uh, next, next slide. This is regarding the procedures for challenging arbitrators. Yeah. In our case, for example, we challenge the nomination of um, co-arbitrators as nominated by the claimant uh, based on the ICC rules, for example. This is uh, what we call it the institutional uh, challenges. Okay, next, now we come to the, the most important part, actually, uh, of uh, this presentation regarding the International Arbitration Proceedings Award and its enforcement. Yeah, We are talking about the beginning of arbitration. Uh, the beginning of arbitration uh, normally uh, uh, depends on, for example, uh, depends on uh, the provisions under the arbitration agreement among the parties whether, for example, they refer to a certain forum, refer to a certain rules. And in our case, for example, it is based on the ICC rules. When it is based on the ICC rules, the beginning of the arbitration 
uh, 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 mostly uh, will be uh, started with the submission of uh, requests for arbitration. Yeah. So, so there was a request beginning of arbitration is started with the request for arbitration to the to the for example uh, ICC secretariat and then the ICC secretariat pass this uh, request for arbitration to us as respondent or as counsel of the respondent to respond and then to prepare what we call it the answer to the request for arbitration based on other rules for examples they prefer to use uh, the terminology of notice of us arbitration instead of request for arbitration so it it is more depends on uh, the rules that have been selected by the parties in their arbitration agreement after uh, the parties submitted requests for arbitration and the other parties submitted the answer to the request for arbitration they they were they will be dealing with some uh, preliminary issues yeah and uh, in some rules for example there is a requirement uh, to prepare also a statement of claim and statement of uh, defendant yeah I would like to uh, directly go through the uh, hearing process, yeah, to the hearing process. Of course, uh, with the assumption that the parties have agreed on the TOR, what we call it the term of reference. They have discussed uh, everything about uh, uh, the arbitration process. They have agreed on, for example, uh, they have agreed on appointment of all the arbitrators and then all the bundles all the bundles of the case have been transferred from the secretariat of the for example of, uh, of the international chamber of commerce a court of arbitration to the arbitration tribunal and then the two parties have to agree on what is called as the tor term of reverence yeah to prepare uh, everything uh, for the hearing the hearing process yeah and of course during that uh, period the president of the tribunal uh, issued some uh, procedural orders and sometimes they also uh, orders to hold what we call it as a case management conference call yeah case man management conference call can be uh, in the form of uh, telephone calls, conference calls, but can also be in the form of a video conference call, yeah, to discuss everything on the procedural matters yeah, before start the hearing process. Next, now we come to the next, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. This is the hearing process, yeah. In the hearing process, in principle, the chair can decide procedural issues through what we call it, the procedural order. And then the scheduling of the hearings regarding the place of the hearings, local bar requirement, whether uh, 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 is decided for the close hearings, on the record proceedings, for example, record of proceedings, the party, yeah, a state step by the tribunal, for example, uh, uh, can uh, appoint a third party yeah, to record the proceedings and to prepare uh, the uh, minutes, yeah, the minutes of the hearing process, and and then to select the technology to be used, yeah, and then time limits per site, default appearance, expedited proceedings, etc. Yeah. Next, uh, uh, next slide. Then we are talking about the presenting evidence. Yeah. Before uh, I'm talking about the presenting of evidence, I would like to inform you that due to the pandemic situation, 
although un under certain articles of the uh, ICC rules that uh, uh, if a party if a party insists for example if a party insists that there must be a physical hearing instead of virtual hearing then the tribunal should hold what you call it as a physical hearing but due to the pandemic situation uh, finally we agreed that uh, instead of physical hearing we agreed to conduct uh, uh, what we call it as a virtual hearing so in our case yeah in the pandemic situation we hold uh, a virtual hearing uh, last month in september yeah for three days yeah for three days we hold the virtual hearing uh, and this is about the presenting of evidence uh, there are some rules on uh, presenting of evidence including uh, iba rules of evidence uh, and then there are some documentary uh, evidence can be in the form of hearsay evidence authentication legal documents legal documents is very important yeah in the international commercial arbitration and of course above all it will be arbitrator uh, discretion uh, to uh, for example to decide yeah whether to use this evidence as a consideration uh, to issue uh, award to the parties next uh, next slide please we are talking about the uh, fact witness yeah as as you may uh, aware that uh, in the international arbitration uh, cases uh, parties are allowed to propose witness yeah whether it is an expert witness as well as also a uh, fact witnesses yeah uh, the fact witness in principle may provide its testimony uh, prior to the hearing he could also provide in some cases for example uh, provide some written witness statement yeah and if a party, for example, choose to have a fact witness, uh, this, the one who, sh who could be uh, appointed as fact witness is the one who actually knows exactly uh, the case, yeah. knows exactly the project, like knows exactly the, 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 the contract among the parties. Yeah. In our case, for example, we did what we call it as a cross examination so we have received we have received the the written uh, fact witness from a key witness a key fact witness in the case and and based on this written uh, witness statement provided or proposed by the claimant then we do cross examination yeah to know exactly the consistency, the truth, and everything regarding the written statement that he made in the fact witness. Yeah. And after the hearing process, including uh, the process of cross-examination to the witness, then, for example, the, uh, the arbitration tribunal give some opportunity for the parties for example to prepare uh, what we call it as the close closing submission yeah close before before the tribunal uh, uh, prepare and consider uh, to issue the award and normally uh, they give opportunities to the parties and based on the consent of the parties uh, to prepare what we call it as the closing uh, submission in our case at the moment we are still preparing a closing submission and including submission regarding to the cost 
uh, in flight. Yeah. Now we are talking about uh, the next the next slide. We are talking about the types of award. Yeah. About the award. Uh, the award uh, uh, can be in the form of the uh, orders. Uh, we have to know to make a distinction between orders and award. Yeah. Orders uh, normally refer to the procedural orders during the process, while the award is very important as the final uh, product of the uh, arbitration tribunal. We are talking also about the types of award, validity of award, remedies and costs, uh, rest judicata effect, confidentiality of the award, and post-award post proceedings. Next, please. Uh, yeah, there are some types of award, actually. Yeah. There is some interim awards. Uh, there's also partial award, uh, final award, consent award, def even uh, if even def default award. Yeah. We, we are now uh, after the arbitration process, after the hearing process. Uh, the two parties at the moment is considered considered to get. Uh, an amicable settlement within the arbitration process. So this is actually uh, what we call it as a hybrid process. The combination between arbitration, mediation, and arbitration, or we call it this art met art. Because when we found out, based on all the documentation, based on the documents from the two sides, based from the information, based on the fact, yeah, at this time, we consider to settle the dispute through mediation process within the arbitration. So when, for example, in 10 days, we are trying to agree on everything, for example, including settlement of payment and everything, then we would like, we would like to, incorpor to incorporate the consent in the mediation process within the arbitration process into what we call it as the consent award. So the consent award is actually award uh, issued by the tribunal, but the content of the award is actually based on the consent of the disputing parties. While this default award is the award issued by the tribunal, uh, in the case that uh, one party absence from the arbitration process. Yeah. Next, uh, we are talking about the validity of the award. Yeah. The validity of the award can be seen from its formalities, communication, time limits, and it also consists some, for example, concurring or dissenting opinion or views among the arbitrators, and then scrutiny of the draft award, and then finality, clarity, and scope as a, a, a principle of the validity of the award. And in some award, it also it could also contain some uh, uh, issues regarding the remedies and costs. Yeah. Uh, next slide. This is about remedies and costs. For example, there was a breach of certain contracts which caused damages to one party, and then the, the claim for compensation, for example. Then all this will be calculated, yeah? Uh, uh, the monetary damages, and then in, they have to also calculate the interest other remedies because, for example, they invite third party funding to fund the arbitration process, for example, and other costs. It is all calculated, yeah, and then it will be uh, a part of the award of the tribunal. Next, if the award has been uh, delivered, is there any possibility for a party uh, to 
set aside or to cheat or to challenge the award there are some methods of challenge and there must be some grounds of challenge and there are some provisions on time limitation and there are also some effect if the challenge is successful for example next we are talking about the grounds of challenges challenges uh, can be in the form of the jurisdictional challenges for example yeah i i would like to give you an example of one article uh, under the agreement between the parties if the parties agree in their agreement that there must be some steps to be taken by the parties prior to submitting the case to the arbitration and if one party can prove that all this process has not been done by another party so he can challenge he can challenge or this party can challenge the arbitration process based on this jurisdictional challenge so if this jurisdictional challenge uh, successful then the case uh, uh, the, the the arbitral tribunal will decide that the arbitral tribunal has no jurisdiction over the case and the case closed under this arbitration tribunal um, there are, my apology to interrupt uh, yes. the time remaining is five minutes five minutes okay i hope i can finalize in five minutes Thank and you. there are some procedural challenges of course uh, uh, and challenges on uh, based on the merit and uh, next slide we are talking about the enforcement of the award yeah we are talking about the application of international convention on recognition and enforcement of foreign uh, award indonesia is uh, a party to the convention on the recognition and enforcement of a foreign arbitration award for example and there are some principles governing recognition and enforcement there are some requirements for enforcement but also there are some grounds for non enforcement under uh, the convention yeah. now we are talking about the requirement for enforcement next please uh, yeah it, it consists of some scope jurisdiction uh, and forum non-convenient for example and procedures for the, the enforcement and there are also some grounds for the non-enforcement under the convention next yeah this is the ground for non-enforcement under the convention it is related to the incapacity and invalidity of the award incapacity of the tribunal lack of notice or fairness to the parties arbitrator acting in excess of authority for example the tribunal or the procedures is not in accord with the parties agreement and if also the award is not yet binding or has been set aside and then there are some subject matter not arbitrable or based on uh, public policy in indonesia uh, most of the uh, objection to enforce arbitration uh, mostly based on the public policy and there is a good dissertation on that uh, written by professor tinaka london she was the assistant of professor sudargo gautama and final uh, final uh, uh, next next final slide is the list of relevant instruments for your reference i think uh, this is to end my presentation. Thank you very much for the moderator. Thank you very much for Professor Zupanchana for such an interesting and fresh uh, materials for us students to learn more about arbitrations, especially the procedures. There are many interesting questions, but there are, if I could uh, conclude two questions in one, um, relating to the conflict of interest in terms of the um, testify procedures. Um, how if a witness is unwilling to present and how is the IBA guidelines addressing this? Since Article 12 of the Uncentral Model Law on International Commercial Arbitration has provided that the justifiable job 
is enough to challenge the appointment of an arbitrator. So party doesn't necessarily have to prove the conflict of interest. How is uh, the IBA guidelines addressing this problem? I think the conflict of interest majorly occurred in several proceedings in arbitration especially. Yeah. I will not uh, specifically uh, refer to the IBA uh, guidelines because this IBA guideline is is not always uh, uh, not on always uh, bound the parties yeah but uh, the principles of uh, no conflict of interest is very important in uh, nominating as well as appointing an arbitrator yeah I would like to tell, this is the real story about our case, for example. We found out that based on our profiling, yeah, this, this uh, uh, nominated arbitrator has a special relationship. For example, uh, he or she was a professor of one council from one party. We found out that. And then secondly, uh, he, uh, he or she, when he or she was uh, the head of a law firm in one area, for example, this law firm, the law firm, his or her law firm, with the law firm of the councils have for example, have an agreement to cooperate. And the third that we found out, for example, is that her act toward the government of Indonesia, yeah, toward the government of Indonesia, is always against the government of Indonesia as reflected in his or her articles, for example. So when we have such an arbitrator to settle the disputes in our case, it will be for the disadvantage of us. Yeah. While it will be for the advantage of the other, the other party. So this non-conflict of interest principle is, is very important. And we need some clarification from him or her on our accusation that that uh, she has some she or he has some conflict of interest i, I don't want to mention the name yeah because uh, uh, the basic principles of uh, 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 arbitration is very uh, a secret to other parties yeah and and uh, that was the case yeah the conflict of interest independency impartiality of arbitrator is the key issues that is very important uh, because even though she is nominated by one party but she must be she must be depend uh, uh, she must be independent yeah she must be impartial she must be neutral she must have no com conflict of interest to the other party that is very important if we would like to have uh, a neutral award uh, as a final award, for example. Yeah, okay. that's okay, my answer you. to the questions. Thank you, Prof. Subanchana, for answering the questions. I think due to the limit, limit of time, I will choose two more questions um, yeah. which haven't been addressed before. I think um, the topic of um, artificial intelligence, Prof. This, is, this one is from Dini Kartika. Um, I would like to ask, how is the procedure of the arbitral proceeding by using artificial intelligence such as robot? Could you explain more the challenge and the benefit using um, artificial intelligence? In yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe some of you have read the book of Klaus Schwab, yeah? the president of the World Economic Forum. In his book, uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0, yeah, Industrial Revolution 4.0. In his book, Industrial Revolution 4.0, Professor uh, Klaus Schwab have mentioned that the, con uh, the, the, the 
integration yeah, or convergence of three basic technology, information and communication technology, physical technology, and biological technology may change the way we do everything, including the way we do business. This include, this include uh, the technology, what is called as the artificial intelligence technology. And in the future, yeah, much more of the works will be done by robot based on artificial intelligence. For example, when we are talking about virtual banking, for example, if we are talking about virtual banking, in the future, there will be some banks without any human intervention there. Yeah. Everything will be served by this AI-based robot. Yeah. In our discussion, in Bali International Arbitration and Mediation Summit last year, in October or November last year, Professor Chao Yun at that time also attended the, the conference. There was a very hot discussion between delegates from America and delegates from Australia. Yeah. The delegates from America, for example, insist that in the future, the position of arbitrator can be, can be replaced by the AI-based robot. Why? Because this AI robot, uh, robot is a learning machine. So if you put all the data there, all the information there, they can easily make a, de a decision and they, they can make a decision faster, more accurate, and there is no distraction from, for example, there is no doubt about its independency, oh, okay. impartiality, and there will be no conflict of interest. That was, that was the position at that time by the, the US delegates. But on the other hand, the Australian delegates at that time insist that even though, even though in some ways, some profession can be replaced by the AI-based robot, this, this what we call it as a learning machine, yeah, but at the end, robot cannot be made responsible, cannot be made liable. At the end, control over AI robot is still in the hand of the human being. So these two approaches emerge during the discussion. Yeah, but at least, at least, these are some ideas that in the future, in the future some legal profession, including arbitrator, can be replaced by this AI robot, or this is what we call it as a learning machine. Yeah. That is my answer to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Zou, um, Professor Sufancha, I mean, for the answer. I think one more question. Um, okay, from, um, from Agatha. Prof, I would like to ask if in arbitral proceeding the party want to bring the joinder, but the party, but the third party who was elected to be a joinder refused. In this case, whether the arbitration tribunal can um, break for the joinder presence or not. Thank you in advance. Yes, uh, in our case, there was the case. Yeah, one party as a claimant. Yeah, propose to have a second claimant. This second claimant, because there is an agreement between uh, the two parties, between the, the first claimant and the second claimant. But from our side, we have no agreement with the second claimant. So based on what we, what we call it as a privacy of contract, this second claimant is the third party. And the arbitration agreement is only between claimant and respondent and not involve this third party. So at that time, at that time, we challenge, yeah, we challenge the proposal for uh, 
for joinder from the claimant yeah because there is no relation between between us and and the second claimant that that was the case yeah thank you thank you thank you Professor Panchana for the answer i think that's all for the questions and for those of you who haven't mentioned in this session you can perhaps uh, directly address the question from perhaps yep. if you uh, Please send it to my email yeah. okay uh, we will the as, uh, what uh, professor uh, chao has also said yeah okay thank you for today's session i think um that's all for today's session for thank professor you very much.